that we can start proceedings. have lots of space in the atrium and again I assure you that you will be fully involved in the proceedings and you'll be able to join in with the celebrations we're about ready to start just waiting on the last few honored guests who are now making their way to the seating upstairs and to the atrium I can see some very steadfast guests. And I applaud, I applaud your steadfastness. I will also ask for your kind indulgence. Mr. President, distinguished guests, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this symposium celebrating the 60th birthday of Amina J. Mohammed, a life characterized by service and impact. It is such a pleasure to have you all here. And we've put together a very special event, you know, with lots of input, lots of exchanges that again will affirm her great impact, both within Nigeria and around the world. In just a minute, we'll be standing up to sing the national anthem. To officially kick off events, can I ask that we all rise to sing the national anthem? to have it displayed on the screens behind me and once that happens we will all say it together all right may we oh god of creation direct our noble cause guide our leaders right help our youth the truth to know in love and honesty and living just and true 
great lofty heights attain to build a nation where peace and justice shall reign. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I think that every time I'm at an event and we have the second verse of the national anthem, people go, oh wow, yes, that's such a good verse. We like it so much. We should say it more often. And yes, I, I'm very glad that we're able to say it today. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event. My name is Ari Topo, and I will be moderating activities for the next couple of hours. Before we go into the main program, I would like to take the time to recognize some of our distinguished guests. We're all distinguished guests, but I'd like to crave your indulgence to please take some time and recognize the presence of special people, some certain special people. First of all, of course, we recognize the presence of the President of Ni the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhab Muhammadu Buhari, ably represented by his Chief of Staff, Ambassador Ibrahim Gambari. We recognize the presence of the former President, former Republic of Liberia, Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. It is my pleasure to recognize the presence of Dr. Kayode Fayami, Governor of Ekiti State and Chairman, Governors Forum. We recognize the presence of the Governor of Plateau State, Simon Bakula Long, Chairman, Northern Governors Forum. It's my pleasure to recognize the presence of the Governor of Gombe State, Alaji Inuwahayahaya. I'd like to recognize the presence of the Governor of Kaduna State, Nasir El Rufai. It's my pleasure to recognize the presence of the Governor of Borno State, Engineer Babagana Umar, Umar Azulum. I recognize the presence of the Governor of Bauchi State, Senator Bala Mohammed. It's my pleasure, it's my pleasure to recognize all ministers here present, as well as our traditional rulers. Special note for Alaji Abubakar Shehu Abubakar, Emir of Gombe and Royal Father of the Day, ably represented by Dr. Aliu Modibo, former minister of the FCT. We recognize the presence of the Emir of Nasarawa, Alaji Ibrahim Usman Jibril. We would like to recognize the presence of Alaji Aliko Dangote, President Dangote Group. It is a special and personal honor to recognize the presence of Ambassador Abdullahi Yerima, who's an important father figure to the celebrant. We recognize the presence of Malam Lawa Aboki, Chair, Board of Trustees, Center for Policy Research and Development Solutions. And once again, I welcome all our distinguished guests from all walks of life who are gathered here to celebrate, to make a brief introduction for the Center for Policy Research and Development Solutions, which was founded by Amina J. Mohammed in 2011. It's a think tank, think tank that engages in robust policy discussion and research, as well as development planning to design lasting solutions to address developmental challenges. It is created to see a future where the empowerment of the poor and marginalized is central to achieving sustainable development. And now, we're going to go into something that's a very special part of the proceedings this evening. In honor of Amina J. Mohammed's life, we would like to show you a series of videos that we hope will do justice in highlighting her extraordinary drive to bring about change in people's lives, especially the lives of women and young children. We will go on this journey through the voices of the people who know her best, starting with her family, then her friends and her colleagues, to the people she's impacted and mentored, and special birthday messages from Nigeria and beyond. We'll play these um, videos in a series of four, and I'd like us to go ahead and play the first one. Thank you. As one of the world's greatest female leaders, the woman of the moment, world's greatest female leaders, the woman of the moment, the United Nations Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, Amina Mohammed, Amina Mohammed has risen from humble beginnings in Nigeria to become the UN's most powerful woman. 
working for the United Nations makes me a global citizen and a really proud Nigerian. For more than 30 years, she's worked hard to shine a light on the developmental challenges facing our world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really honored interviewing this force of nature, Madame Amina. Amina Mohammed has been a strong voice for women's rights. I'm humbled, really humbled, to accept this award working for the United Nations and the world that we want. She's a true champion for climate action. And every challenge has an opportunity to bring solutions to the table, never giving up. Every day I strive to serve humanity, ensuring that the voiceless can truly live a life of dignity. Amina was a very kind and loving child. She was caring, determined, and always eager to help others, and had a very keen sense of humor. Amini was a fighter from the very beginning, landing feet first, and that's when I knew she was destined for greatness. I haven't really sometimes got the words to describe how I feel. Very, very, very proud of her, and I always say that. Amina has always been an honourable character, right from us growing up as kids. I remember us in Kaduna, always playing together, and at the same time, she was always there for us, being the eldest in the family. I think she's always been somebody that doesn't like injustice, and that's really the path that she's chosen, and that's why you know, her journey is where she is today. I don't think anyone could have ever achieved what Amina has done because it takes a certain type of person and those people are so rare. I met Amina in the late 60s, I think it was. She must have been like five or six years old. Um, I remember her dad dropping her and Yasmin off at Capital School Kaduna. She had this fiery look in her eyes. Yasmin was crying her heart out. I remember it like it was yesterday. Her personality is pretty much what it is today. She's a go-getter. She's always been focused, always doing what she wanted. Growing up, uh, there are two things that always stand out. Her tremendous uh, uh, selflessness. She is always, you know, uh, uh, projecting that quality of a leader. She's uh, very, very patient and always very pleasant to be with while growing up. One thing that amazes me up till today is how she is able to balance a very punishing work schedule with paying attention to her children. When you see her with her kids, when she devotes her time for the kids, you will assume that 100% of our time is for the children. You know, growing up, our mother always stressed us the importance of identity and knowing where we came from. She would always speak to us about treating everyone equally and no matter where we came from or where life took us, it is important to stay grounded and whenever we can, we should give to the less fortunate. She's been wrecking. Before we continue, I would like to recognize the presence of some more distinguished guests. It's my pleasure to recognize the presence of Alaji Umar Mutalab, elder statesman and accomplished banker. We recognize the presence of the U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria, Mary Beth Leonard. We also recognize the presence of the National Coordinator, Chief Executive Officer, African Union Development Agency, the new Partnership for Africa's Development, Princess Gloria Akubundu. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome for the welcome remarks, His Excellency Mohammed Inouye. His Excellency Mohammed 
Muhammad Inouye Yahaya was born on October 9, 1961 in Gombe State. With decades of experience in both the public and the private sector, Alaji Yahaya started his career with the Bauchi State Investment and Property Development Company as an accountant, and he rose to the position of principal accountant. His Excellency's foray into active politics began in 2003, when he was appointed Gombe State Governor of Finance and Economic Development. He served for seven years and was elected elective, Executive Governor of Gombe State on the 9th of March, 2019, under the platform of the All Progressive Congress. Your Excellency, sir. Your Excellency, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, heavily represented by the Chief of Mass that are here today. Uh, Your Excellency, the former President of the Republic of Liberia, Honorable Johnson Salif, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Honorable Ministers and advisors. Your Royal Highness is here present, especially our father, the member of Gwembe, heavily represented by uh, the member of Gwembe, uh, Dr. Ali Umadib Omar. Honorable ministers and advisors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of us. Let me start by saying that uh, I feel highly honored to be invited to give these opening remarks and to welcome you all on this occasion of the celebration of one of our own, uh, Hajia Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. And uh, let me say that uh, personally, I'm not uh, somehow a birthday freak, but because my own birthday comes and goes sometimes without me noticing, it's only when I see a lot from either my bank or some organized, very successful figure, and a dignified person, a person of caliber, Haji Amin Muhammad, is worldwide. And when that opportunity came, I jumped at it because I have the belief that uh, uh, there is going to be a group like I've seen today of people that really uh, move us and shake us that will really give contribution in the discourse, especially since it is going to go along the line of a symposium and discussion on some uh, on the recent developments. And doing so meant that uh, I must personally explain or give reasons. And so I don't look at Amina as an ordinary person for so many reasons. And looking at it from the background from which she came from, as shown to us, and her upbringing and the trajectory on which she was brought up and her performance that she did on so many assignments that were given to her or that she assigned to herself. I think uh, her 60th birthday is worth celebrating and worth uh, participating in. Um, going by her background, ordinarily in pre-independent Nigeria, one would not have expected that a typical Fulani man that came up from the far north, in fact, from the northeast, where events that are unfolding show the vulnerability and the lack of development that is there, would have, at that time, you know, their attempt to go and study in the United Kingdom. And not only so, to look at the nature of his people and decide on taking away that will help in advancing their course. A typical Polani man that indulged in going to study veterinary medicine 
in those days. And not only that, did not stop at that, but even went higher to consummate an arrangement and marry a Scottish woman that we saw today. <laughs> it was not very ordinary. And as a result, I'm not surprised that the product of that marriage is being celebrated today. And from the onset, she was meant to be an international figure, going by the mix from Gombe to United Kingdom and eventually to her birth and to the upbringing and so on and so forth. So for me, around in the 80s, and she went to facilitate, you know, both state government's involvement with the African Development Bank in order to provide health facilities in Gombe and Bauchi State then. And she did very well and succeeded, you know, in what we have today as a federal teaching hospital and, and uh, some other health facilities that are in and obtained in both the present Bauchi and Gombe states. Not only that, she continued and participated in so many things, particularly, you know, uh, uh, her roles that she played in the MDGs, both in conceiving and executing the projects and program of the MDGs and later the SDGs, and subsequently, you know, uh, her role that she went to play as a minister of the environment and eventually her becoming uh, Deputy Secretary General uh, in the United Nations. That makes her the number two person in the civil society, I mean, international uh, civil service and, and um, diplomacy. And that's a cause for us to celebrate. That coincides with her birthday and her reappointment. Because of the role she played, she deserves to be reappointed, and she has recently been reappointed. And that comes as a double celebration for us. And we are very proud, <laughs> we are very proud of her performance, both before and now, and I believe going forward into the future. And uh, I see Amina as a special gift a golden gift not only for the people of Gombe State and Nigeria at large, but in fact to the whole world, seeing the role and the job that she's doing now, trying to transform the world and make the world to be a better place for all of us to be proud of. And as of the event we are holding today, and maybe tomorrow and subsequent days, that will encapsulate into the celebration of her 60th birthday, I can say that uh, the topic for today, overcoming the challenges of African transformation through this center that she set up, which has been up and doing since 2011, I think is very apt and uh, is an opportunity for us to think deep learn deep, learn from our mistakes, and see how best we could transform and change Nigeria, and indeed the whole world, for the betterment of its people and for those that are yet to come. The African uh, community is really bedeviled by issues. The, some may be attributable or more of our own, but globally, there are some challenges that equally Africa is experiencing from insecurity to the effects of desertification, climate change, to the effects of unemployment, poverty, disease, and hunger, which the whole, especially African society is facing with the setting of the pandemic. But not only that, we have to look at it from our own perspective as a people and Nigeria as a nation. I have the belief that if we think deep, plan big, and act big, we have the capacity to transform Nigeria into a better place. 
and people like Amina have the wire with us and have the experience and the knowledge you know, to put us through. And to that extent, I believe going by the discussion of the paper that is going to be presented by Her Excellency Ellen Salif will have a lot to learn and will have a lot to benefit from her own experience and knowledge. And I would la like to comment on the roles and responsibilities that we as a people, I think we need to add to do on top of what we are doing for our own women folk, you know, to have the opportunity and the chance to participate or to even lead so that we see transformation based on the ideals and principles that Amina stands for. And I believe uh, if we follow the correct steps and give them the opportunity, both in terms of uh, capacity building and in terms of opportunity to serve directly and to guide into what uh, we need to do, we can easily achieve that. Um, Amina's experience for us in Gombe is really something we are very proud of. Her performance, her contribution to humanity is really worth emulation. And we believe we are giving that support. And I would like to urge not only her, every other woman, and in fact, every individual should go back to his people, do what is needful for us to effect and bring the change through the transformational you know, agenda or formula that have been unfolded these days. In Gombe, we deliberately uh, appoint uh, a woman to be the chairman of the Civil Service Commission. We appointed a woman to be the chairman of the Teacher Service Commission. These are the two places that really human resource management really goes to in terms of public administration. And not only that, we strategically appointed our key women commissioners into key positions, like Minister of Environment, like the Ministry of uh, Science, Technology, and Innovation, and the Ministry of Women Affairs. With those three, and what we have down the ladder, we provided the platform on which women can actualize themselves and participate in uplifting our people and pushing Nigeria forward. So I would like, I would like all others, especially our colleague states, to copy from us. And I dare say that if women are given opportunity, especially coming down history with 60 years or more after independence and the level of degradation or non-performance at least against the set targets, maybe we can achieve more. So we, can give, we should give them a chance. Let us push them to the level. And Madam Amina, the sky is wide open for you. At Gwambe, we are ready to give you that support. And I believe in other places, you will get that support too. So I wish you well going forward. And I pray that you'll continue to contribute to humanity and to the people, not only of Gwambe, but people in the world at large. The sky is the limit. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you protect you and give you the wisdom and the strength to go ahead with what you have been doing. For us, I would like to uh, guarantee you that back home, we solidly stand by you and we shall continuously support you. For those of us that came, I want to thank you very much after welcoming you and I pray that you contribute much and give all the positive you know, remarks and guidance that will help us in seeing us through this occasion and for those that are yet to come. I thank you so very much. God bless you. God bless the public of Nigeria and God bless us. Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your welcome remarks. Before we proceed, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to recognize the presence of the Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria, His Excellency Yemi Osimbajo.
We have a number of goodwill messages, which we can only expect, you know, since we're celebrating such a distinguished personality. And so we will begin with a goodwill message from civil society. It is my pleasure to welcome from the Almajiri Child Rights Initiative, Mohamed Sabo Kiana. Can we welcome him, please? Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, all. Very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I would like to uh, stand on existing protocol and to give my short um, um, goodwill message to Her Excellency, our mommy, Ms. Am Ms. Amina J. Mohammed. Um, we, from the Almaji Chara Initiative, would love to really express our great um, appreciation to you. For, the, for being a great voice for the Almajiri children. Uh, in 2018, when we first um, launched the Almajiri Child Right um, Day to amplify the plight of the Almajiri children, um, we are looking for uh, voices to really um, help us amplify uh, the plight of these children. And we wrote to her, you know, not having any contact, of course, um, and to our surprise, she indeed, um, and help us to you know, make a statement at that time. And even uh, since then, she has been a very great supporter and ally to um, the cause of the Almighty children that we are, we are trying to uh, amplify. So today on your 60th birthday, um, I want to really say a very big thank you to you for being a great mentor to a lot of us, the young people, and being a great voice to indeed millions of the Almighty children that our organization um, is um, uh, advocating for, for their social, uh, for their education and social inclusion. So um, it's a great honor and, and privilege for me today um, to celebrate your big day today. We pray for Allah, to Allah to continue to guide you and to protect you, to increase you in wisdom and knowledge and continue to give you the strength to um, serve humanity and that you have always been known to do. So um, on behalf of um, Almighty children, and all the young people in Nigeria, we wish you a very, very big happy birthday. Happy birthday, mommy. We love you so much. Thank you very much. My sincere apologies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm told that the vice president is on his way, but not yet here. Moving on to our next goodwill message. It is my pleasure to welcome Governor Nasir El Rufai, Governor of, Executive Governor of Kaduna State. Um, I'm told that Ms. Mohammed grew up in Kaduna and has a very personal relationship with the state. Your Excellency, sir. Your Excellency, the host governor, the Governor of Gombe State, Your Excellencies, my colleagues, governors here present, Honorable Ministers, Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, and members of the Diplomatic Corps, my friend and brother, Al Haji Ali Kodangote, Mrs. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former president of Liberia and the celebrant, my sister Amina J. Mohammed, ladies and gentlemen, good, good afternoon or ev good evening. I stand here as a friend of Amina, her brother, and her real governor. The Gombe State governor is just pretending to be the governor. I say this because Amina may have origins in Gombe State, but she spent the better part of her life not in Gombe State, but in Kaduna State. To the extent that when she was nominated as cabinet minister in 2015 by President Muhammad Buhari, 
there were petitions from people in Kaduna State accusing me of nominating my friend and sister as governor from our state and referring to the Constitution, saying that even though she was born and probably grew up in Kaduna State, they didn't care. The Constitution said she had to be an indigenous of Kaduna State, and she was not. Of course, Substate, who is here, Mrs. Zainab Shamsuna Ahmed, again my sister, got nominated from Kaduna State. So we in Kaduna State consider Amina one of our own. We have a better and superior claim to her than Gombe State. But since the governor of Gombe State is my brother and my in-law, I will concede for him today to be the host governor. <clears throat> Amina is a remarkable person in every way. Uh, you have begun to see from the videos how she has always been prepared in mind, in body, in experience, in every other way to be a leader. Was not surprised at all that she has risen to be the world's number two public servant. In Kaduna, we are very proud of her. We appreciate all that she has done to put Kaduna on the map. We appreciate that all she has done to put Nigeria on the map. We appreciate all that she has done to put women, northern, Fulani women, on the global map. She's an inspiration not only to us, but to all our young daughters who can now grow up confident that their role is not just limited to being housewives. They can be anything they want to be, from being minister to being governor. I have a female deputy governor in Kaduna, encouraged by Amina, by the way, to do that. And also to be the deputy secretary general of the UN. This is a powerful inspiration to millions of young girls in northern Nigeria in particular. Parts of Nigeria have always had their female role models. We've had Ngozi, we've had Obi, we've had Margaret Ekpo, we've had Gambo Sawaba in politics, but we've never had anyone as accomplished on the global level, beyond just the regional and national level, like Amina Mohammed. Amina, we are very grateful to you. You do not know. You do not know how many young girls You've, you, you've inspired and will inspire, and whose life you will change simply from your example of the possibilities that exist when a person gets educated, remains focused, develops networks, and does things in pursuit of a better humanity for all of us. We congratulate you on your birthday. We hope and wish you many, many more yes. We hope to be here one day to celebrate your 100th birthday. Don't laugh with the advances in medical science and how healthy she looks. She may just be there for another 40 years. I doubt if I will be there because um, I take too many risks and create so many problems that I don't think, I don't think I'll be allowed to last for so long. So your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for all coming here to celebrate with Amina and all her friends and family. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I would say, uh, Amina took all the blessings in my view of that family because my best friend in the family is Karen Mohammed. She is more known for being naughty than being a global leader. So you see, I mean, uh, Karen, you should... Uh, Go to Amina and give her some of yours and take some of hers so that we can dance, lay, you know, uh, very well. Uh, Karen has always been a dancer. She's tried to teach me. I've never been such a good dancer. So on this note, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I'm joining the governor of Gombe State, 
and the pretending governor of Amina, to thank you all for coming and wish you safe journeys back to your destinations. God bless you, Amina. God bless all of us. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Our next goodwill message will come from the Royal Father of the Day, the Emir of Gombe, Alaji Abubakar Shehu Abubakar. He's ably represented by the former minister of the FCT, Dr. Aliyu Modibo. Let me begin by extending the apologies of His Royal Highness, my Emir, who wanted so much to be here this, this afternoon, but was held back in Gombe and is attending some to very urgent royal duties. He asked me to represent him here and read a short, a short speech on his behalf. We begin, Your Excellencies, by recognizing all that are here and abiding by all protocols. And His Royal Highness wants us to remember that we are beginning this event by thanking Almighty God that allowed us to witness this, to witness this epoch occasion of 60th birthday symposium of our illustrious daughter and leader, Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. As some of you may know, Amina is a descendant of one of the illustrious families in Gombe Emirate. Her father, Dr. Inwa Mohammed, throughout his career, Dr. Mohammed applied and dedicated himself to the well-being of the pastoral Pulani and their livestock all over Nigeria. Because of Dr. Mohammed's untiring dedication to the nomadic Fulani, my late grandfather, the 10th Emir of Gombe, Malam Abubakar Umar, bestowed on him a position in the Gombe Emirate Council with the title of the Sarkin Fulani. To the best of our knowledge, he was the first Sarkin Fulani of Gombe. We are today living in witnesses that his first child and daughter, Amina, has continued the legacy of serving people with compassion throughout her career, which has catapulted her to the exalted position of a Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. In this regard, I wish to seize this opportunity to remind our dear Amina that whilst at the United Nations, she should help in bringing the issue of pastoralism or more comprehens uh, comprehensively, or more comprehensively nomadism and its challenges all over the world in these modern times to the purview of the United Nations system. The problems of transhumans goes back to antiquity, where the scriptures tell us of the story of Cain and his brother Abel, who was a keeper of sheep while the other one was a tiller of the ground. The contemporary versions of the problem must be resolved within the shortest possible time to avoid the catastrophe threatening pastoralists in Nigeria and Africa as a whole. I think the time has come for the United Nations to find lasting solutions to conflicts related to nomadism and transhumans by devising global standards and best practices for those who chose the freedom to live that way to find a sense of belonging and to coexist peacefully with those that opt for sedentary lifestyle. We are therefore appealing to Her Excellency Amina Mohammed to facilitate the process of helping the endangered pastoralists in Africa have a sense of belonging and ultimately secure their right to the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I am confident that Her Excellency is the right person for this track, 
given her exemplary track record as Nigeria's Minister of Environment and the global relationship between nomadism, climate change, and conservation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you sincerely for listening and wish our celebrant good health, peace, prosperity, now and always. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your, Your Royal Highness. Our next goodwill message will come from the Governor of Ekiti State and Chairman Governor's Forum, Dr. Kayode Fayemi. Your Excellency, sir. Can we have a round of applause, please? Excellencies, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I was still trying to catch my breath. I didn't know that um, I would be asked to come out so soon to, to speak. But um, uh, it's a delight uh, to be here this afternoon uh, in honor of a woman of substance. That may sound like a cliche, but it is not. Um, Amina Mohammed has been known to many of us from our civil society past. And she's always been one person that has demystified power almost to the point of casualizing it. Yes, she's Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations now, but in all of the positions she's held before then, it's always been about what value she's able to add, what difference she's able to make and how best will the citizens, the ordinary people that she seeks to serve, benefit from her service and sacrifice? So it's not a surprise that she's gone on this trajectory to the point that she's reached, which has now led to a reappointment one more time. Uh, it speaks more to our values as a human being, as a public servant, and whether at the time she was working on education for all issues or country, and then went on to work on preparing the world for the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and a brief stint with us in the cabinet of President Muhammad Buhari during his first term in office. Uh, to a return to the UN system, she, she does it seemingly effortlessly. And I, I always tease her that how do you come out of this, like this, even when you're so much under pressure? You never get a sense that she's under any pressure, and yet she manages to deliver on time, uh, on the issues, and in a manner that speaks truth to power at all times. So for us as governors who have worked with her at the Nigerian Governors Forum level on issues of security, sustainable development, since she assumed 
our position at the United Nations. Uh, and lately on, on COVID-19, we've been engaging her uh, on issues of vaccination, of vaccine manufacturing, local manufacturing of vaccine. And, and she's been quite handy working with us and working with the Presidential Steering Committee on, on, on these issues and reassuring us that we'll be able to overcome many of the challenges. So for us, well, the new people say 60 is the new 30. Um, and certainly, Amina looks 30 to me. Uh, so we, we wish Amina well. Uh, we know that the best is yet to come, even though many will think, oh, this is it. There is nothing more after uh, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. But, but some of us who know our doggedness, who know our determination, who know uh, of our ability to pull people together towards desired ends and outcomes, we are very confident that she'll continue to be of service uh, to us because for her, it's not about the title. It's not about the office. It's about impact and influence and outcomes. And we will continue to work with her in the forum to make sure that this country, this continent, and indeed our globe attain all of those goals that she's been at the forefront of working on, the sustainable development goals, so that we can build a better world, and first and foremost, a better country, Nigeria. Thank you. God bless. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And finally, we have a special message from the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari, ably represented by his Chief of Staff, Ambassador Ibrahim Gambari. Your Excellency, sir. Excellency Ellen Johnson Sali, former president of the Republic of Liberia. His Excellency Mamadou Inua Yaya, the pretending who's governor <laughs> from Gombe. I know that um, the governor of Kaduna State is always contesting one thing or the other. <laughs> Never disappoints. Other governors here present, honorable ministers, the Royal Highness, the Emir of Gombe, ably represented by uh, Dr. Aliu Modibo, other Royal Highnesses, our friend and brother, Aliko Tangote, and then I have to recognize Ambassador Yerima Ibrahim Abdullahi Sarikimbai of Gombe, who is uh, not only a father, but we describe him as one of the endangered species in Nigeria. I will explain why. There are only five of us left out of 18 who were Buhari's ministers in 1984. And he's one of them. members of the diplomatic corps, our very own elder statesman, Elijah Umar Mutalab, and the celebrant, Amina J. Muhammad. For those of you who may not be aware of some of the UN usages, uh, they called the Secretary General SG and the Deputy Secretary General DSG. What it really means is not 
Secretary General or Deputy Secretary General, but uh, Deputy Scapegoat. <laughs> because when things turn out well at the United Nations, the big powers, the P5, they take credit. When it goes wrong, they have ready made scapegoat in the Secretary General and his deputy. So thanks for being such a readily available deputy scapegoat for the UN system. Mr. President has directed me to represent him on this occasion, and it's a pleasure for him uh, to do so, to celebrate our daughter and a global citizen, Amina Muhammad, who has consistently made us proud as a nation, as a continent, and projects the most positive image of Nigeria, of Africa, and of womanhood. Mr. President is equally pleased to welcome another formidable daughter of Africa, Ellen Johnson Salib, the former president of Liberia, and an inspiration to our children. Maya Angelou's insightful quote, nothing will work unless you do, alongside the apt mantra from Nelson Mandela, when he said, it always seems impossible until it's done, end of quote, embody the career and drive of Abena Muhammad, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. From our early days coordinating the Task Force on Gender and Education for the United Nations Millennium Project, to our role as the Senior Special Assistant on the Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, to three consecutive presidents of Nigeria, to our appointment as Nigeria's Minister for Environment in 2015, under the, the government of President Buhari, Amina has always exhibited the distinctive quality of being an articulate. And if you don't believe me that she's articulate, just watch when she comes to that podium and shows you the stuff of which she's uh, made of. But above all, a purpose-driven technocrat who works to create the change that the world wants to see. Starting her career off in Nigeria during the military era as a co-founder of an indigenous architectural firm, Amina, who has always advocated for easier access to education, especially when it comes to women and girls, focus on designing schools and clinics to bridge the gaps in education and healthcare within and beyond Africa's most populous nation. After this successful stint in the private sector, and also as a civil society activist for inclusive education, realizing the long term, that the long term and sustainable change that she sought to see in our country and the continent would only be achieved from within the government, she went to serve three successful, successive Nigerian presidents, including President Buhari, advising first on poverty, eradication, and gender equality. Next, public sector reform, and finally, sustainable development through an important role in the Ministry of Environment. In this capacity, Amina has always selflessly led from the front. As senior special assistant on MDG, she pursued, she pushed for the implementation of notable ideas like um, the establishment of a virtual poverty fund and conditional grants scheme to help alleviate the plight of the low income earners in Nigeria who currently make up more than 40% of the country's population. This is why, as Antonio Guterres assumed office as the United Nations Secretary General, his appointment of Amin Ajay Mohammed as his deputy was Nigeria's loss, but a huge gain to the rest of the world. A signal to the world that achieving gender parity and advancing sustainable development through the world body will be a fundamental priority during uh, his tenure. And I think the Secretary General has in fact uh, declared that he has achieved 50-50 parity in terms of senior appointments at the United Nations. I think she'll be commended. Since her appointment as Deputy Secretary General and as Chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Group, Amina Mohammed has again driven 
the campaign for the issues under her purview from the front. The mother of six has since led the reform of the UN development system and the implementation of the sustainable development goals that she has previously helped to give birth to. And to really appreciate the significance of this, uh, one has to know that in the United Nations, everybody is in, in support of coordination except when they come for them to be coordinated. And she has the duty of coordinating the entire development system. In her role, she has emphasized that with the adoption of the SDGs, the world body is not just putting a hand, a band aid on the problem. It's becoming fit for purpose and searching for its root causes to address them effectively. It was no surprise, therefore, when after the renewal of his appointment earlier this month, the UN Secretary General graciously reappointed Amina for a second term as his deputy, only the third deputy secretary general and the second African and the first, so the third female deputy secretary general and the second African at all and the first Nigeria to become, to occupy that post. <laughs> and at the risk of adding to Mr. President, so who knows, who knows? Five years is not far from now. She may become the first female Secretary General of the United Nations. As she pursues her mandate and executes her work with an urgency of a woman pursued by sense of overwhelming purpose, Amin Aji Mohammed, the highest ranking female in the United Nations and multilateral system, has said that the SDGs must be seen as a global people's agenda as its core. It represents our shared aspiration to thrive on a healthy planet in which no one is left behind. As she turns 60, Mohammed still has her work cut out for her at the United Nations. She has set giant targets for herself and the UN, and so far she has proven by her actions which have translated into achievement that she was not only born to lead, that she came prepared to do the job. Mr. President, indeed, all Nigerians are proud of her. She's indeed Nigeria's gift to the world, a source of inspiration for all, young and old alike, but especially to the young and the girl child in Nigeria and our continent. Happy birthday, our very own Amina, and many returns in great health as you continue to serve humanity so effectively. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, sir, for that special message from the President. At the risk of sounding quite cliche, our guest lecturer and keynote speaker is someone who really needs no introduction. She is, continues her activism through the Ellen Johnson Sirleaf Presidential Center for Women and Development. In 2019, she was selected to join the elders and was also appointed a health workforce ambassador by the World Health Organization. In 2005, she was elected the President of the Republic of Liberia, becoming Africa's first democratically elected head of state. Among her many accolades, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 and is a dedicated farmer, mother, and grandmother. Distinguished guest, here to talk about overcoming the challenges of Africa's transformation, it is my pleasure and my honor to welcome the former President of Liberia, Madam Ellen Johnson Sirleaf.
His Excellency, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, represented by his Chief of Staff, the able and well-tenured international servants, Ambassador Gambari. His Excellency, the host governor of Gombe State, I don't know if the Vice President is here, but let me, let me just say on him that I, I wish he were, and I recognize him anyway, even if in, in his absence. Excellences, governors, ministers, officials of government, international organizations, family and friends of our honoree, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored and perhaps a little bit daunted to be the guest speaker to an audience of such accomplished people. It is no secret that Nigerians have a reputation for energy, resilience, and informed determination. My gratitude goes to, our, to my junior sister, Amina Mohammed, the founder of the host organization, the Center for Policy Research and Development Institutions, CPRSD, as well as to the leaders of the center. Last week, I participated in a closing ceremony for the training program for some young people who are part of a group usually called Sogos and dismissed as vagrants and troublemakers. The training was supported by the Andrew Brooks International Center, a Liberian NGO organized to the memory of the second woman president of the United Nations General Assembly, who was Liberia's and Africa's first. The video, the video played showed the daily lives and homes of the young people, an area surrounded by a fetid swamp, entered by stepping boards on stones, built to be quickly removed when chased by police for petty thefts or other crimes. I left the venue deeply in thought. What more could I have done during my time as president? When what I inherited in 2006 was not for the faint-hearted, but was it enough to ensure a massive debt relief to make progress in building our institutions and rebuilding our infrastructure were my priorities well placed. These are some of the challenges of leadership and legacy. The imperative of a compact of trust between a leader and her or his people, on which I will speak later. But we are here to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Amina Muhammad, an acclaimed leader. I call her my junior sister, and today we recognize the extraordinary African woman who is a global leader. I got to know Amina during the process of the work of the United Nations Secretary General High Level Panel on the formulation of the Sustainable Development Goals. She served as the Special Assistant to then United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon 
and was pivotal in the robust global consultation that resulted in the 17 goals. I recall her strong voice for the recognition of the interlinking of the goals as the means of success and for a people focus with gender and equality at the core. Amina is a force of nature, but also, but also a consensus builder. It is very difficult and usually unnecessary to disagree with her. <laughs> she brings ideas to the table with clarity and energy, propelling others as they see new possibilities of which they may have never thought. I'm very proud of Amina, and I know that you are, as she plays this critical role in our premier global institution, the United Nations. Secretary General Guterres has recognized Amina's talent by asking her to remain as his deputy for a second term. The speed and ease with which he, he has been re-elected with her must be credited in good measure to the recognition by member states of what she has brought to this winning team. During the SDGs formulation process, Amina taught us lessons about leadership that it happens at all levels and can come from unexpected persons. She was mindful about nurturing leadership, particularly of talented women. The Ebola crisis taught us of some of these same leadership lessons. When leaders reveal themselves in stricken communities, many of them women, they did not wait to be led. They assume leadership and only ask for support, the space to act, and the resources to save lives. I had the understanding that to provide the visible leadership for the daunting goal at her hand, for me to stay the course, I had to know that to defeat Ebola People needed to have trust in me. People who had no formal leadership responsibilities, but who became visible and vocal, agreeing to an unspoken compact of trust. This was the servant leadership often spoken about, the leaders who set the best example, who risked their own lives to save others. We need to see more of such examples at all levels in our society, particularly at the top, where the responsibility is greatest. I say this in the context of the cruel COVID virus, which has wreaked havoc, deepened inequalities, muted the progress toward gender equality, and eviscerated some of the most fragile economies. It has exposed the deep inequalities between rich and poor countries and uncovered the deeply entrenched racism in many societies. A response can be found by action of individual leaderships, but it is more effective when it is done collectively by all our nations. This is the unity of Africa called for by our foremothers and forefathers, which is needed now more than ever. Let us recall that African leadership standing together and having a united voice on critical issues brought an end to deputism in the Gambia 
and I want to commend President Buhari for the role he played in a mediation team. African leaders standing together has led to sanctioning military takeovers, to taking a common position on global issues, such as the reform and better representation of the Security Council and the formulation of a long-term vision for the, for the continent which aligns with the, with the 2030 global vision for the achievement of the sustainable goals. It is now time for a common impetus on the pandemic, including the promotion of more robust national health systems on the solution of the increased terrorism in several of our countries, better pricing, and value addition in our primary commodities. It is time to address the issue of gender equality, to promote increased number of women in top leadership positions, presidents, prime ministers, and others, in recognition of their capabilities and contribution to development. But today the world face a more distressing challenge. The COVID-19 pandemic in its new variants, like the Delta, that are spreading with unknown consequences, undermining the progress made to date by so many countries. There have been pandemics before, but most were somewhat limited in the areas it attacked simply because human beings were not as mobile. This pandemic is spreading widely. It is happening in a world where traversing continents on a regular basis is normal. It follows several years of erosion of multilateralism, a drifting into isolationism and population by many countries and a retreat from international collaboration, often a precursor to the, move, to the move from democracy to autocracy, sold as the way to accelerated development. If there is a silver lining to the pandemic, and that is called comfort to those who have lost loved ones, lost jobs, or become homeless, it is that the leaders of the world led by women leaders have begun a turnaround in large measure to recognize the value of collaboration and cooperation. They have expressed recognition of the need to face squarely the long existing inequalities, injustices, and racism that have created a yawning gap between the rich and the poor. They also know the gap as wide and deep as it is, is still insufficient to seek to shield them from the COVID pandemic. Fascination of the total population in the North, which is the current plan, will not solve the problem if billions of poorer people remain unfascinated. New variants will emerge faster than the vaccines can keep up. Viruses, and misinformation of social media platform do not need passports or visas or permission to travel across borders. Distinguished friends, we know that a lot needs to be done, and I will get to that later, but right now, fascination is the answer and timing is the key. People are dying. People are getting sick. With all the resources available to the richer nations, the record shows that to date, less than 13% of the global population has been fascinated. And in Africa, the percentage is not more than 1%. The race is on, and the pace is quickened as the wealthy nations use sometimes unusual means to resolve the fascination hesitancy 
that most countries face due to a lack of confidence in leadership. We therefore plead that Africa and the poorer nations are not left behind. We ask for the redistribution of surplus vaccines for voluntary licensing and waiver of intellectual property rights and for the transfer of technology from the vaccine manufacturing pharmaceutical companies of the North to support the manufacturing of vaccines closer to the focus of need. Let us recognize that some responses are at hand, even if it still falls short. President Biden of the United States and European nations have pledged, I believe, some two billion doses to be delivered by the end of 2022, but seven billion doses is required. And so, this is still talk and promise because the latest information reaching me is that to date, not more than 600 million doses have been delivered. For us, that is a problem. That could be a tragedy. The recent, agreement, the recent agreement initiated by Africa with the j and &J Company for Vaccine Technology Transfer Hub to be located in South Africa is a step in the right direction, but we need support for more. For example, similar hubs, hubs in other places, such as Nigeria, Senegal, and other nations of the South. There are other essential requirements to beat the virus, the need for adequate financing for the purchase of the vaccines and for other public goods, such as therapeutics and diagnosis and a range of other material. Financial institutions are called on to provide adequate financing required for this purpose. I really cannot emphasize enough on the need for resolute and nimble leadership to overcome the pandemic and the other challenges we face. The International Monetary Fund has been exceptional through its visionary head, Christina Chokfina, who is one of the examples of the type of leadership needed. She has not been afraid to shake the IMF from its normal cautious stances and has said that vaccine policy is economic policy. Others? like the World Bank in its head, as well as several European nations, have pitched in with commitment for financial support for the Act A and the COVAX platform established to deliver vaccines and public goods to lower and middle income country. But let us be clear, Africa has said on the basis that it has primarily responsibility to take the lead. Africa has given the best response to the pandemic. First, in early action through lockdowns and messaging to restrain the virus and the effective interventions to establish the COFAX platform. We owe much to the African Union designated COVID-19 leaders, Presidents Ramaphosa and Akufo Addo. There are also others who stand out in the mobilization of resources to fight the pandemic, strive, Masayiwa, and right here in this room, Aliko Dankoti from the private sector. <laughs> Vera Songwe of UNECA with a strong call for the reallocation of special, special drawing rights. Dr. John Kenga Song who has led the Africa Center for Disease Control and has won the confidence 
an unprecedented level of financial support for the institution and its expanded role. Finally, on this subject, as co-chair of the WHO Commission Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response, I must say that our report calls attention to the need for a two-track approach. The first is to tackle the current pandemic, and the second, equally important, is to ensure that the world does not face another pandemic. Our eight-month study, based on research and evidence, led to detailed recommendations on the two overarching actions, a reset of the international system, a better represented global architecture, and a reform of the world health organization. As we go into the future, we will find ourselves leaning on those institutions who will play pivotal roles, going beyond the urgency of the crisis to ensure sustained effort. Leadership at the United Nations, at the World Trade Organization, at the African Development Bank. Surely, you recognize the role that has to be played by those Nigerian leaders who head these institutions and who will be called upon and relied upon to take Africa to the next level. Distinguished guests, let us now move to the subject of gender equality. Amina is our star. She, like me, and other women leaders of the world have been subjected to the same barriers, stereotyping, the same denials of access. She, like others, have been fortunate to experience the, a life trajectory considered exceptional. In her case, having started at the primary school by Lake Chad, the achievement of equality and equity will continue to be our life's goal. We work for it. Through the United Nations African Union Women's Leadership Network, of which I am patron, and Amina is a chairperson, is a champion. She works it through her center, the CPRDS, and I do so through the flag program of the EJS Center, the AMOJ Initiative. Our goal is common, the ascendancy of women to top leadership positions at every level in society. We know that women must themselves work for this in collective effort to achieve this, to achieve this common goal that they themselves must go beyond the fears of dirty politics and be prepared to challenge any attempt to discredit their efforts for a rightful claim to their role in society. The issue of gender equality will continue to be a litmus test for our countries and all societies. It is hard to understand why with all the evidence at hand that ending violence against women, ensuring their education, and promoting their past participation and voice in national decision making are not the yeast and the flour in the bread of development. That there is still such disparity and inequality in power and rights between men and women. And I am now going to be I'm muted, but also, but also elevated by the example of His Excellency, the Governor from Kambi State.
Because the question that I've wanted to ask, in Nigeria, to whom we look to for leadership, leadership in all aspects of our endeavor, why have we not had a woman governor? The office of authority at the local level, which speaks to the acceptance of women leadership once it has been rightfully earned. I thank those who have talked about deputy governors and to you, Excellency, from Combe State. But I still ask another question. What will it require and when to have the second elected woman president in Africa? One last point. We know that the support by men will be the tipping point because they must recognize the capabilities and contributions of women to sustain development and to the peace and security of nation. Those of you, our fathers, our brothers, our sons in this room, please hear me. For your wives, for your sisters, for your daughters, who have all the rights of which I have spoken. They look to you to lead the effort. They look to you to be the change that we look forward to. Distinguished guests, let me come back to the subject of trust within the context of leadership. Today, in every society, we have cynicism, criticism, and the disappointment of youths in national leadership, justified or imagined. The hard truth is that as leaders, we too often exercise power over and not with the people. It is so easy to concentrate power and authority at the center. It is also easy to issue authority and demand compliance without the communication to facilitate confidence and the building of trust that leads to a unified effort on the part of the citizenry. The Ebola crisis was perhaps my greatest test in this regard. We had never experienced such a disease and initially we tried some measure, essentially military restraint of movements, which resulted in a serious playback. But very quickly, I pivoted, understanding that leadership needed to be rooted in both science and the solutions proposed by community leaders who know better through cultural and tradition, and tradition to obtain the compliance we sought. Many were women who only asked for the space to act and the resources to save lives. I know they needed to trust me to believe that I would stay the course. Today, we all need to realize that a compact between the leader and the people is the effective achievement, the effective means of being able to encourage our youth to achieve their national goals and their aspirations. 
I now turn to the issue of institutions, which is the most effective means of understanding the complexities and achieving the implementation of development goals. African leaders have to date place emphasis on the development of national institutions as the key element in the transformation chain, and this is certainly rightfully placed. But we also need to recognize that they have gone far beyond this through policies and direction of the African Union and regional institutions. African leaders have adopted a common impetus for regional integration, bolstered by the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. This impetus must be two-pronged. Greater trade of goods between African countries themselves and a common approach to value addition for natural resources. There are so many examples that exist for this regional effort toward regional integration, and I can mention one that I know the West Africa Power Pool, which has, like Cote d'Ivoire, selling electricity to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, a good example of sharing and maximizing natural resources. Another example away from West Africa is the newly opened Kasangula Bridge linking Zambia and Botswana, which is already ensuring faster transportation of goods and easing the travel for many in the Sadic region. There are no doubt so many more examples that time would not be allowed to see. But we, all we need to do is to thank our African leaders for this action that is pulling us all together with common goals, common aspirations, common achievement through collective effort. Several research and analytical institutes and think tanks are based at the national level, but working regionally to turn the aspiration of Africa's development vision into reality. I can speak for the work of the Africa Center for Economic Transformation, which works with both the African Development Bank and the World Bank with a vision of support to our nations for implementation of an informed, engaged, and broad African agenda encompassing government, civil society, and industry as the key to realizing the economic might of an integrated Africa. Again, there are so many more of these think tanks ready to serve, ready to play the role. Distinguished guests, as I come closer to the end, let me say that I marvel at the role Amina has played in this country, serving as a minister in many capacities and in the private sector as well. I mentioned her work on the sustainable goals, but now know that before that, she played a major role in the Millennium Development Goals, which preceded and led the direction for the SDGs. In her role as Minister for Environment, she keeps us thinking what to do. She brings to us a passion for people and planet, pointing to all of us that climate change is real and is increasingly evident in all our countries. Land degradation, desertification, and heavy rains at usual times are wreaking havoc on livelihoods, in many cases forcing displacement and contributing to conflict over increasing scarce resources. Climate change and environmental protection must also be viewed through the lens of gender equity given the numbers of women affected and involved in the food supply chain. I come to the issue of generational change, which is the last, but it is critical. I began by telling you about a group of young people, largely young men, living in destitute and degrading conditions. All our countries have young people like this. They must be brought from the periphery to the center of national processes and indeed to the center of our hearts. These are millions of young people who have had the fortune to receive good education 
Many of our young people have the creativity and ingenuity as they break through with technological skills to bring our countries into the digital age as the pathway to propel the, to propel the changes that our countries need for the competition required for today's world. A final word on this, Africa's youth represent the largest percentage of young people in, a world, in the world at a time when there is aging in many of the older and more developed nations. The world will recognize that Africa will be needed to propel the world through our skills for which we have paid the price of underdevelopment. To achieve this, our African leaders and those long in power will have to come to the realization that change is at hand, that there comes a time when one must support and encourage generational change, enabling our young people to take the leadership that they deserve and that we have prepared them for. There comes a time when one must let go. There is no guarantee of success when you do this. But this must not be the example and the excuse to hold back this required process of change. Because the majority of our youths are able, possess the integrity and the commitment to move Africa toward the achievement of its aspirations. Allow me to President Nelson Mandela. I recall his remarks made in London during the period of the occasion of his 90th birthday, when also I gave the sixth Nelson Mandela lecture, mine in Johannesburg Day. He reminded us that our work is far from over, that there is much that remains to be done in the fight against injustice for a better distribution of the benefits of economic growth, for opportunities to be made equal to enable more Africans to rise above poverty, that much more must be done so that more have access to health, shelter, and education. To never forget the thousands of people, primarily women and children, who continue to die from assault, abuse, and hunger. To achieve those dreams and objectives of Nelson Mandela requires a disruption of the status quo, not gentle nudges. It requires bold action to be different, to stand up and stand out. It requires our African leaders to continue the paths that they have chosen for collective action for the better good of Africa. Amina, thank you for the good disruptive change you have made in all of your endeavors. Thank you for the inspiration and the motivation 
that you provide to every young African girl and women also who see you as the role model, the example, the person they would like to be. Thank you for being you. Happy birthday, Amina, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for such a challenging, thought-provoking speech lecture. That there is a birthday present for you from Madame Sirleaf. It's right there. Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. A handwoven quilt made by the women of Liberia. It features the logos of every entity that Ms. Mohammed has worked at. And of course, in the middle, a quote by Madame Sarlif. Thank you so much, Madame. There was definitely very much to think about in that lecture. Much about not just our challenges, but the possibilities, the importance for regional effort in the transformation of the African story, and the work that young people have, the promise also that young people have, and the need for young people to be brought to the center of the transformational process. I have very much to think about with this conversation. And while I reflect on that, I would like to invite us to watch another quick segment of the video put together to celebrate Ms. Mohammed. Can we have our second video, please? ...of one's conviction that all people in the world have the rights that must be respected. The MDGs themselves proved that we could galvanize the world together around goals. The goaling worked. But how did we make them sustainable? How did we really reach everyone and make sure that no one was left behind? I think for me it was always about caring about those that didn't have. I was always very concerned um, that, you know, there were barriers for people that I didn't have, for education, for access to basic services and rights and opportunities. Um, and so I had a cause, and, and the cause was, you know, to look behind me and not ahead of me, and to make sure we were bringing everybody along. Tell you very clearly, Amina is a people's person. And I've seen this passion, this drive, all through her career. From when she was in Norman and Dover, to when she joined Afri Project, to when she became coordinator education for all, to when she was SSAP MDG, to when she became a minister, it has been this passion. She is a complete, you know, humanist and very passionate about the empowerment of women and the poor. She's a completely detravelized de Nigerian. She has friends, colleagues from every part of the country, and I dare say now, every part of the world. I mean, I lost Nigeria. And um, in all her work, Nigeria is in the center. 
when she had me, she was actually on her way on a road trip, I think to Sokoto or somewhere in the north from Kaduna, and I came early. So from the day I was born, I was part of her movement and I guess her journey. The, she was very strategic in selecting things that have worked in health and education. And it was around things like having, uh, uh, having a health facility that has a borehole that people from that community can come and get water. It's about a school, having a school garden that the children of the school can actually eat from their own school garden. So, so for me, those were phenomenal. People say that, how do you test a human being? Give them power and give them money. And that's when I think you know who the person is. And I think that to a large extent, I think that she has um, maintained uh, her humanity and she has maintained who she is. And that to me is probably the most important achievement that she has made, uh, despite the title, despite who she is in the world and what else she can do in the world. She has succeeded in truly being who she is and she has made that uh, qualities of her. Her ability to juggle so many things at the same time and also to absorb details uh, in respect of whatever she's dealing with and deal at a very sophisticated level of information and still be able to execute things efficiently. I think that's perhaps one of her most outstanding qualities. I mean, she started out as a professional, but her breadth of vision and desire to be of service to the greater society rather than just herself or her immediate family almost made it inevitable that she would be where she is today. When it comes to her personal relationship with people, one of her strengths, and I guess that is also part of the key to her being a born leader, that she's one of these very few blessed people who is capable of making every single person she meets uh, feel that they're special to her. God has made certain people to serve their families and maybe their inner circles, but he's made others to serve humanity and the world, to make their mark and to make a difference. Uh, my mother is one of those people. The only purpose of Of course, it's impossible to have a birthday celebration without listening to the celebrant. And so it is my pleasure to inform you that we are about to listen to a special conversation between Amina J. Mohammed, UN Deputy Chief and former Environment Minister of Nigeria, and a very accomplished journalist who I will now proceed to introduce. Foli Batibo is a journalist and principal presenter for Al Jazeera English, based in Doha, Qatar. She joined the network in 2010 and has hosted some of Al Jazeera's most important specials and award-winning programs, including the first ever debate of candidates to the post of UN Secretary General in July 2016 and the Nobel Peace Prize interview in Oslo in December 2016. She has interviewed some of the world's top leaders newsmakers, and other influential people. Her ability to break down complex news stories and present them to the viewers in a smart and unbiased way have garnered her praise and recognition. Distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to welcome a very, very esteemed colleague, Foli Ba Thibault. Can we have a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Harriet, for your kind introduction. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you all for being here for this special event to celebrate and honor a true leader and an inspiration for millions across Africa and around the world, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Nigeria's very own Amina Mohammed. My name is Foli Batibo, and I usually have the pleasure of speaking to the Deputy Secretary General on the television screen on Al Jazeera. But this day gives me and gives all of us a unique opportunity to pay tribute to an exceptional woman who's done so much through her tireless dedication to service and improving the human condition. I'm not gonna go over her CV and what she's achieved, but as you've heard from previous speakers and guests, Amina Mohammed is a woman who came from a privileged background, yes, 
but with an incredible sense of responsibility to help those around her and create a better future for everyone. Her long and distinguished career has seen her work across the private sector, civil society, and as a highly respected uh, civil servant, both nationally here in Nigeria, regionally for her continent of Africa, and internationally, of course, for the United Nations. But what drives Amina Mohammed? What are her passions? We'll find out in just a moment when she joins us for our conversation. But there is one thing that we can be sure of, and that is the Deputy Secretary General's unending effort to promote women and young people's right, to make sure that they have access to health, education, jobs, and prospects, and to make sure that we, as women, have a seat at the table. And that is why, by virtue of the fact of who she is, the second in command of the most powerful organization in the world is inspirational to me and millions of young girls in Africa and around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, your excellencies, please join me in welcoming our guest of honor, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed. Thank you. Where am I sister? Thank you. There's a lot of people. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you feeling after all these tributes that we've heard today? I was going to ask you, who are they talking about? <laughs> Amina Mohammed, of course. Okay. Amina Mohammed. There are many of us. There's one in Kenya. Yes, but there's only one exceptional one, daughter of Nigeria. Thank you. You know, one of my favorite stories about you, and I don't know if anyone today mentioned it, is one you told during your TEDx talk in 2013, describing how you left Nigeria to pursue your studies abroad when your father wasn't in favor. And he said that you should raise your own funds for it. And so you bet everyone that you could walk from Kaduna to Zaria, 76 kilometers. And <laughs> it's a great story. I mean, and people put their money down. Yeah. And did. you did it. They didn't think they were going to lose You it. did it. Mm. And I think, you know, that story for many of us encapsulates the spirit of Amina Mohammed. Whatever she puts her mind to, she achieves it. So let me start off by asking you, what is it that makes you tick? What motivates you to get up every morning and do what you do? Huh, it's a loaded question, but I think, um, I think for a long time is that recognizing that I came from a very privileged background um, and that there's so many people that just don't have what I do mm -hmm. and there's no reason why they can't have that and more. Um, and then being in a position, I come from a family that are of service. My mother is a nurse, my father is a civil servant. Mm -hmm. So it's always been about service and to those who don't have justice, to, the, to those that um, have no opportunity um, and don't have an equal right to do exactly what I'm doing. Right. Um, and, and to know that every time that I've been in a position to try to make that different, then that wakes me up every morning. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it gives me sleepless nights because I realize that there are millions and millions like that. Right. You see five daughters, as I am, and we know what that means in our African context, our Fulani context, to, for a man not to have a son and for a woman not to have given her husband a son to carry on the name. Mm -hmm. How did that affect your path in life and the choices that you made to become the woman that we're celebrating today? I think first things first, my father never felt us, uh, made us feel any less because he didn't have sons. Um, and he encouraged us to do just as well. Second thing is, I'm Amina Mohammed, so I'm still carrying my father's name. Good, well done. <laughs> um, but I think what it did, it, it, um, it, it shaped for us a, a reality mm -hmm. that out there wasn't going to be so easy, um, but never to use it as an excuse to prove that you could do equally if not better, 
uh, that one men did if you had the right opportunities. And so I think it did shape, it did shape the, the ambition, it shaped the courage, it shaped the stubbornness um, uh, to try to get that done. Um, but it was overcoming many, many challenges. And you know that from the north, we have a, a culture that is not as forthcoming. Everything is about being behind the scene. It's not being there, you, being invisible. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it, it's especially uh, for women for women. It was like that. I mean, I lived in a man's world and um, Perhaps that too is is credit to who I am today is that it's so many men um, Have been part of shaping my life by being really brothers to me being mm -hmm. mentors to me as well So it's not just about women It's me finding myself in that space and then finding a whole lot of people who had some belief in me right. um, perhaps were um, you know I was pretty stubborn, and so they were trying to just move me out of the way. Okay, just give her what she wants, and then <laughs> peace. <laughs> right. So you've had a, a really, truly inspiring career, Mina Mohammed. You're not a single story, daughter of Nigeria, proud African, Muslim woman of color, and one of the most recognizable global citizens in the world today. A and your career has been an example of a path to service. So let's start from the beginning and talk to us about how it all began, how did you begin this path of service and why it was something that came to you so naturally? As I said, I think we always grew up in a home, in a community. Um, everything has been giving. I mean, that's why I always say Nigerians are always giving. We're not very good at tourism. I hope the Minister of Tourism is not here, but um, <laughs> in ourselves as Nigerians, we're very giving. So we're right. brought up in community that, that does give. Um, mm -hmm. And so my first, uh, my first thoughts when I came back, let me, let me say that after I came back from the UK, my father, you know, promised this wonderful job um, in the US mission here. And I thought it was really cool because I was coming back to Nigeria, I was gonna work for the Americans um, and very excited. And when I got back and I said to my father, where's the job? And he just said to me, my daughter work for the Americans? Go and find a job. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, um, I went to find a job and I was, you know, really grateful to have found one with Arch Con Norman and Doba and a, a great mm -hmm. architectural, right. um, you know, engineering company. And, and that's where we started. We were designing and building schools and hospitals. Um, and so once we got past the design, public buildings, institutions like Secretariats in Bochi, right. um, once you went through, um, you know, the job of designing, then came the, so what happens with the building? And I remember that vividly with many of the projects that we had, that we never had the, the staff to go in them. We never had the maintenance of the buildings. And so that also um, allowed me to go look for the resources and question, um, you know, it has to be more than the bricks. Uh, what happens to the building afterwards and, right. and, and building from that? So the private sector taught me a lot. Right. Um, the and what's interesting about your career, I have to say, is that it hasn't been restricted to one sector. You've worked for the private sector, for the government of Nigeria, for civil service, and of course, currently, uh, for the United Nations, uh, but what's been consistent is, is the focus of your passion and, and that is working to make sure that no one is left behind, especially women and girls. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you about whether, you know, from the different paths that you cho chose, whether the civil service, public sector, which did you find to be the most effective? Which of these corridors? Ooh, public service. Um, public service because um, the position of government is the most powerful position that you can hold. Um, in civil society, you can inform it. In the private sector, you can help to shape it. But the real decision making of where a nation goes and how it is built is about public service and public office. Mm. Um, and if you use that power well for the people, you can make a difference. And that's been my experience. It's been my experience watching my colleagues, some of them in the room today, um, and those not. Um, that they've used public service well, whether it's at the local level or it's at the global level. Right. Well, with a Nigerian father and a Welsh mother, you've often spoken about being Nigerian in its focus. You've served three Nigerian presidents, which speaks, I guess, to your commitment to this country. Four. Okay, there you go, four Nigerian presidents, <laughs> which speaks to your commitment to this country. A and each of the roles was different. What did these roles mean to you? And what do you think you brought to them that had a transformative impact on the lives of the Nigerian people, whether it was Minister of the Environment or the other roles that you've held? I think each was very different. I came at a different time. Mm. Um, I came when we got debt relief for Nigerians. I know the international community were not convinced that debt relief for Nigeria, A, was worth what we had given up. 
and, and B, that when we got it, that we would spend it well, that we were perceived as an incredibly corrupt nation and we couldn't do it. So the first job that I got from President Obasanjo was to spend a billion dollars a year on the MDGs, on people. Um, and I think that the team and I, and, and in government, by the way, we did it. We spent that money on people. And so I think that that was transformative. When we tried to take stock of what we did, it, was, it, it shocked me that after looking at what we spent on water, we, we supplied 40 million Nigerians with water. And that was quite incredible to do in government. And so it proved, I think, that you know government can do things that it's supposed to do, where there is leadership, where there is the space to do it, and there is a recognition that people come first. Right. Well, during your time as Nigeria's Minister for the Environment, you, you had many things that you wanted to achieve, of course, and the Niger Delta cleanup project was an incredibly, incredibly important one, one which you were quoted as saying will no doubt go down in history as one of the biggest ever carried out and which you also described as our collective responsibility. And I remember seeing the news reports of you covered in oil, speaking with the local people. Why was delivering on the Ogoni promise and keeping the Niger Delta clean so important for you? And why do you say it was our collective responsibility? Well, first and foremost, it was about Nigerians. Nigerians where there was a considerable amount of injustice that was meted out at the local level from their local leadership, their state leadership, and national leadership. Mm -hmm. And we had a president at that time, you know, when this came in, that this was important, that we, um, we start this cleanup. Now, it wasn't started in my time. It was started long before. Um, and it was just unfinished business. And we had the opportunity to say that if we were to have, to show Nigerians that everyone had a part to having justice served, then what was it for the Niger Delta? Um, and the Niger Delta, it was a signal about the cleanup. I mean, the cleanup of Oguni is a very, very small part of what needs to be cleaned up in the Niger Delta. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 a, it's a signal of what needs to be done overall. And it had many facets to it, not just about cleaning up, but by preventing uh, more, uh, you know, more spillages, more breakages. And, and that you had to address the root causes for the nation's wealth to come from there and for them to live in that kind of destitution without any dignity that deserved attention, that deserved us to do for them what we would do for anybody else in the country. Would you, would you say that was your perhaps proudest legacy as, as Minister of the Environment? The proudest legacy is I had two ministers who carried on with it. Because it's not often that you find institutionally that that would happen. And um, those two ministers are in the hall today. Uh, one that served with me, who's now the Amy of Nasarawa, um, and of course our Minister today of Environment. And I think if we had not taken the system with us, we had not taken the institutions with us, um, they wouldn't have built on it. And I think that they did, and they've done a far better job than I could ever have done. Um, and that's my legacy. There, you're being event. humble again. This is your, 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 your northern side <laughs> coming up again, being humble and not recognizing and accepting what you've achieved. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, it, it's in the DNA. It's in the DNA. So your, your work on the Millennium Development Goals in Nigeria and your subsequent work building on that uh, to other UN, to what we have now, uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are two things. I think, you know, when you look at the name and you hear the name Amina Mohammed, those are two things that you're linked to, especially on the international stage. Mm -hmm. You've carried that mantle of the Sustainable Development Goals. How do you feel? Uh, about that legacy of the SDGs? And, and do you think today that enough has been done or is there much more that still needs to be achieved? Mm. I think for the legacy of the SDGs, I mean, and, and very much, um, you know, appreciation to President Alan Johnson Sirleaf because she was one of the three um, heads of state and government, um, the only woman, uh, the other was the, the President of Indonesia and then the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Um, and I think that what we did was to shape an agenda that was not just tackling a piece of development, but saying that um, Africa and developing countries deserved all of it, that you were not just coming to look at us in pity and say, well, you know, we're going to come and stop your women dying from in childbirth. But no, you wanted to look at health systems and economies that would grow to provide basic services. All of it. Why could we not have all of it? And that's what the SDGs did, was to frame a discourse um, that allowed nation building um, from the inside out, um, and, and not ad hoc, not to put a band-aid on what is obviously a very big challenge. Um, and I think it's teaching us that this doesn't take um, a year or two years 
this takes generations and, and that's why I appreciated the discussions that we've had about the intergenerational transition. Mm -hmm. That has to happen, right. um, that has to happen if we are to grow and if we are to reach the, the potentials and aspirations of Nigerians and Africans. Right. Let's, let's uh, focus a bit more on, on one of your really, uh, the campaign that you've led for women and young people's rights. And I read the letter which you wrote to your 15-year-old self to celebrate the Day of the Girl. Uh, and, and I want to read part of it to our audience here. And you wrote this, which is really very, very uh, poignant. Be fearless. You're going to love secondary school, she wrote. Continue to be curious, as education will be the stepping stone to your dreams. Your dreams are on track. If, even if you don't know yet all the opportunities and challenges in the wider world, everything you care about at age 15, your family, your friends, school, and the nature you're growing up in are going to be central to your future. And to all you 15-year-old girls today, she writes, study hard, let your voice be heard, and dream big. That's very, very powerful. You've never really made secret of the fact, Amina Mohammed, that education is a critical path, a critical way out of poverty. And if so, what do you think has made a difference? And if not, what still needs to be done? Well, I think first recognizing that as a human being, your first building block um, as you grow will be education, whether it's one that's you're given by your family in your first seven years or whatever happens thereafter. I think that we had access in this country to incredible education in the 60s, and, and we are who we are in my generation because of that education. Today, we have even more access, but we pass through education, education doesn't pass through us. Why is that? It's the quality of education, um, the demand on the system today, the inability of governments to raise enough revenues to, to invest in education um, and health, basic services, basic rights. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can debate why that is, um, whether it is misuse of public funds or it is the fact that you just have not been able to grow as fast as your population is growing and the demands on it, or perhaps a number of issues that come uh, to bear. There may no be one answer to it. Uh, but what is very clear is that without that education, um, the nation will not grow. Um, it will be stunted. Um, it will be led by those that will be less than able to lead, and we won't be able to blame them because we didn't invest in the leaders of today or tomorrow. So then, it's really critical. And, and when you talk about the intergenerational mm -hmm. aspect of it, and, and that young people need to step up and take leadership roles now, when there is that issue of education that's still there, how, how can we make it happen then? Well, it's never too late. I went to a school today in the FCT, and, and the teacher that was teaching is a a part-time teacher, she has 77 children in that class. There is no way that those 77 children are going to get the education that they want, the way they want and that they need, they have a right to. So I, I do think that you know we, we have to put right up front um, a, a decision. Do you want to invest in the future? And, and that first investment has to be um, in, in, in education and, and in doing so, make it available. Right. Um, and this has to start from you know the local government up. This is not from a question of the president is going to educate someone in a local government, it's not going to do that. There's right. government structures and resources that, that are provided for it and we need to do something about that. But fixing our systems today, not just in Nigeria, across Africa, um, is going to take time. So for young people to understand that this is going to be your life journey and to, to as an adds value to the bigger picture, to the longer term, and that it's not going to be a quick fix now that's difficult with this young generation because everything, you touch a button and it, out it goes. Life doesn't go by pressing a button. No, it, um, it certainly is one about you, know, you building and shaping and creating it and doing it with your communities, your, your, your nation. So I think we need a good discussion with our young people. Um, we need to hear them um, and, and we need to co-create the future with them. Not as an afterthought, don't give them prescriptions because that's gonna be their life, not yours. Uh, what we can do is take our lived experiences um, and for my generation, uh, remind people what was good and possible in this country. Because today, people don't believe it is. There is huge cynicism that we cannot make it. Um, and they're so wrong. If there's right. anything that can happen today is that Nigeria can and will make it. 
but it needs individual and collective leadership. Well, you said, well, you said when you have the opportunity to be considered, you have to step up. You shouldn't query that as enough people are already querying it for you. It's an incredible piece of advice, but what do you say to those who ask? But why does she keep going on about the plight of women and girls? If a girl from northern Nigeria can get to where she is, now surely there's no problem, is there? Well, the job's not done, and it's not every girl from Nigeria that, that, that is able today to go where I'm going, and I want to make that possible with my humble efforts to it. But I also want to show everyone else that, um, as the governors have said here today, my, my governor's exceptional. I know I have, you know, he's my governor, but he is, um, because what he has done is really put, you know, girls and women um, in a place from a state where we were completely invisible before he came. We have to know that. We were completely invisible. And maybe I'll say something controversial. My visibility was because I was Yeloku. <laughs> but whatever it was, you know, I was privileged. Um, and many women and girls in this country are not. So what have uh, and you so done? How, what have you done? How, how have you used your power and where you are today to benefit the girls and women of Nigeria? Um, well, I think we did it during the MDGs. We did it by building hospitals and making that available for people to have their babies more you know, safely. And we did it by trying to role model that you can be a leader um, and you can do things um, the right way and you have a set of values um, and, and you can survive that and, and that you have a line in the sand that says you don't, you don't go across it. Um, and I think that that's very important. More recently, I think what for me is, is, um, is, is success is in this first term in the United Nations when I said when I was going, to leave, leave it better than I met it. Uh, I, met, I met the United Nations with eight or nine um, top level management under Secretary Generals that were African. And today, and have still got six months to go before the end of the first term. But there's um, a second term coming. Inshallah. Inshallah. Um, but the second, before the second term, let me finish the first. Um, right. Before the, the, the end of the six months. Um, and, and today we have 19 African women in USGs. Um, so that's, for me, really um, pride because, you know, we didn't put them there as tokens. They are exceptional women and they, they can lead equal to men or better. The real challenge is what we're going to do with the space that we claim. Um, you know, President Alan Johnson Sirleaf was the president in Liberia, and since then we haven't had one that's elected. So once we get the space, we need to keep it. And to keep it, you have to perform, you have to deliver, you have to be the best that there ever is, and to take the men with you. So what's the single most important lesson you teach your, your daughters and your granddaughters about, about you know, women's place in society? What do you tell them every day? Well, I think the most important thing that I have, um, you know, and I'm lucky enough to bequeath to my children every day is their faith. Um, without um, their faith and, and a real deep understanding and belief in the Almighty, you're not going to go anywhere because um, many things fail, God doesn't. So it's the first lesson, and I think we should never take that for granted. Um, you need to say it to your children every day. The second one is about telling the truth about values, um, about integrity, and not crossing that line and holding on to that, because that allows you to go for decades where people judge you um, by your integrity, by you know, who you are. I mean, today, I don't think there's anyone that can you know, say to me, you didn't spend the $7 billion you had for seven years on things you shouldn't have. I did. Um, and uh, those that will speak for it are those in my team, um, those who are in this hall today, um, and, and the millions of Nigerians that did benefit um, from, as we said, the MDGs and the funding that went there. But I think for them, it's faith, it's your values, um, and it's drawing a line in the sand that you don't cross. Yeah. Now, anyone who knows you, Amina Mohammed, knows what an important person the late former Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, was to you not just a brother, but as a mentor. And you've spoken openly and candidly of seeking his advice as counsel as you negotiated your career. And Kofi Annan gave many memorable speeches over the years and spoke on many critical issues, of course, which we still work on today. The importance and the value of youth and the women of Africa was one of them. And I wanna share just two quotes uh, with you. He said, young people should be at the forefront of global change and innovation. Empowered, they can be key agents of, for development and peace. If, however, they're left on the margins of society, all of us will be impoverished. 
Let us ensure that all young people have every opportunity to participate fully in the lives of their societies. There's no tool for development more effective than the empowerment of women, he said. Africa has such a huge young population. Do you think we're missing out on an opportunity here to tap on, on this youth population? I, I think we are risking it. Um, I think in many cases we are not providing the opportunities that are needed, not in some cases because we can't, but in some cases because it, it's not possible, we don't have the resources. Uh, but where we can, are we making the most of it? And, and you know, you have, to, you have to do that. There was a young lady who stood up in the United Nations, not the United Nations, the African Union a few years ago, um, and she said, you know, she had got an education outside, she came back to Africa because she wanted to succeed, and she wanted to grow businesses and be part of the growth of her country. She was a Nigerian. Um, and she said she, since she got back, she had never seen so many barriers that were put in front of her. Um, and what she was asking the leaders in the African Union to do was to take down the barriers so that young people could achieve the potentials and aspirations of their country. And the president of South Africa was the next person to speak after her. Um, and the best thing he could say was, okay, I think she's spoken. Because her last words were, if you don't invest in me today, then your retirement will be less than what you would hope for. And so she reminded us that what you invest gives you a future, a future that you hope is better than you know what you've laid down. Um, but also she reminded us that we borrow the future um, from future generations, and we do that now. And so we owe it to... to how, how does the transition take place then? I mean, President Sirleaf talked about this need for a transition to happen. How do we make it happen when, you know, in some countries on our continent, we have leaders who still want to stay, on, stay in power. Third termism is, is very much uh, still an issue in Africa. How do we make that transition and put more young people in leadership roles? I think you have to look at all spheres of government and it's not just about the president, right? You can have a president that is um, older than many would like them to be. But what's behind them? What is the team? Um, you might have a governor that is older than you would like them to be, but what's his cabinet? Um, a local government, what is it? So I think you need to start bringing and growing young people um, from, from the, the beginning of their careers all the way through. Um, and th that has to be you know, creating spaces. It has to be giving them responsibility. It's got to be co-creating with them. I mean, I try to make that an example in the UN. Um, I, I talk to my colleagues and say, look, give the meeting to the youngest person in your team to chair. You're not giving them your job, but you are giving them an opportunity to know what it is to sit at the head of a table and how complicated it is and complex um, uh, issues and decision making can be. So we have to, you know, we have to make uh, concerted efforts uh, to put them in. We, we, A.B. Mahmoud is here and I went to his chamber the other day. It's full of young people. So he's going to succeed because of that. And if you fill them with old people, he wouldn't do as well. Um, and I think he's doing well because of the young people in, in his chamber. And they're, they're clever, they're, um, you know, they are, they're full of energy and they, they want to go places where this system perhaps would not take them if they hadn't had an enabler. So it's about older people like us and younger people. I think the transition is not for us to leave the scene, it's to move behind them and to give them the support that they will need because they do have the energy and they have the vision for tomorrow. But we have the lived experience. We have the lived experience and no one can take away from you, um, but we should be generous enough to give that, generous enough um, to know when you know, our power, our star is waning and before it goes out completely and our shelf life has expired, we need to give it to young people. I hope your message is heard loud and clear. Uh, congratulations on being invited to continue for a second term as Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. I believe it's the first time in, in the UN's history. I know that you've been asked on several occasions by... <laughs> Um, I, had, I had an avalanche of texts and goodwill messages and everyone was congratulating me for second term. And I said to my colleagues, you know, it's not for the second term, it's because I'm not coming to run for president of Nigeria. <laughs> so she's out of the way now. But you know, women are not out of the way. I mean, Mohammed may not be there, but there are other women there and they must be given a chance at least to show how far they, they can go and an equal, you know, playing field uh, that they can get into and I think they can do it. The votes are with us and they're with the young people. And I think if we get it right, maybe you can get a president that is a woman. Inshallah. So, so what next? Can we expect you to come back to Africa to, to do what? what? What's next? I mean, five years, 
five more years at the United Nations, but surely you're thinking about the no, future. I, I never thought about going to the United Nations. Um, my work was always in this country to make a difference in people's lives here. Um, and it is what I was able to do that I've been asked to do something else and, and I would do it because it's service. Um, but I do think that the best work that I've ever done has always been at home. It's the difference that you make to that one life that you can touch and that you can feel. Um, and so, yes, I go for a second term and I try to do the best not to, you know, to make my country proud, to, to make a difference in people's lives. Um, but I would like to think after the second term that I can come back um, and give a little time to my family. I mean, my children have sacrificed, uh, my grandchildren, my sisters, my mother, um, my friends, I mean, who have had to bail me out of many situations because, you know, they've always had my back, particularly the men. There's many men who bailed me out in this room and I've done things that they're not knowing whether I'm going to come back in one piece or not. So, no, I'd like to come home. I, I, you know, this is a place where it all happens. What finally is the biggest surprise the last 60 years has thrown you and how did you handle it? If there was one thing that you could remember from the last 60 years, I mean, what would it be? And what would you have done differently, you think? Um, I, I don't think I've done anything differently. I mean, I, I've learned from mistakes and failures. Um, I, don't, I think if I didn't have them, I wouldn't be a better person for it. Um, would I have changed this trajectory? I think I had my um, aspirations and ambitions and, and God had his and I'm very happy with what he gave me. And you know, I can wake up every day and I don't think I'm going for a job. I'm just doing things I like doing. So how, how many people are as lucky as that? Um, so no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. And any surprises? No, no surprises. If they were, I can't remember them. Then <laughs> and maybe that's just short-term memory loss because it's, it's 60 years old. But um, <laughs> no, no, no surprises that I can, I can remember. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for being an inspiration Thank to you. us, young Africans. Thank you for leading by example. Really. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I wish you a very happy birthday again. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Ariet, over to you. You know, if we didn't have to round up soon, I, I would sit down for another hour and listen to you both. That was such a wonderful conversation. It's lots of reflection, lots to look forward to, lots to think about. And again, that message about the youth and the next generation, and I definitely believe that. Samira said something I thought was very special in the last video we watched. She said some people serve their families and their inner circles. Others serve humanity. And of course, when you serve humanity, impact, your impact spreads across the globe. We have one more video to show you as we round up today's event. And these are birthday wishes from people whom Ms. Mohammed has impacted and mentored, and well wishes from around the world. Can we have the video, please? I do sometimes question that, you know, could I have done better with the results that I've had? And in every case, yes. Um, but I've come back to saying every one life that I make a difference in is worth it. Every one life that is saved, every one life that goes to school, that has a chance. And I think you have to start from the one to get to the whole. Um, and mine is about getting to the whole, so I'm not done yet. She has the insights, um, having had practical knowledge, um, engaging in the field with a lot of issues. She's done a lot of work. She supported her sisters as the firstborn, you know, the amazing, you know, journey that she has lived. Following the UN um, building bombing, my daughter was critically ill. There were quite a number of people in hospital and um, there were not enough doctors at the hospital. So Amina took it upon herself to take a, an ambulance and go from house to house to wake up doctors, to bring them to the hospital to attend to the sick and injured. I thought that was a, a very wonderful thing to do. She was with my husband throughout the day, going from ward to ward, and making sure that all the patients were 
taken care of. And I can never forget, that's something that really helped us. I would say that Amina is a mentor, a big sister, a friend, um, someone that inspires me. And she's been part of my career journey since then. Uh, as a mentor, she uh, helped me scale through so many hurdles. You have a boss who is both humane and strict, who wants the job done, but who also brings empathy to the table. Um, her career has been an encouragement to many that especially African women can be whoever they want to be. We do what we do today because of the courage we have seen her exhibit and uh, we also we have uh, decided not only to emulate her but to see how we can put the best we have to also make her proud. Uh, she's had monumental impact on my life, uh, particularly inspiring me to delve deeper um, a life of public service, uh, to be able to focus on the things that matter and um, be able to ensure that at all points that the people at the center of whatever uh, agenda we put forth and um, that's had really a very strong um, impact um, in my life. When I decided to become a photographer at a time that nobody thought it was possible, she gave me my first international job, which was the visit of Ban Ki-moon to Nigeria. She decided to have me on board aside from what had already been planned, and that changed my life. I mean, Ajay Mohammed is my hero, my personal hero. I would not be standing here without her support her trust and her faith in me as a young person. I am very honored, I am absolutely grateful, and I know that she will continue to not only inspire me, but other young people um, around her and people that she has met. Amina Mohamed is a wonderful colleague, a wonderful partner, and a wonderful inspiration for all of us in the United Nations. She is terribly hardworking. She is fantastically committed, and she breeds joy and enthusiasm in everything she does. To work with her has been for me an enormous privilege and an enormous pleasure. Hi Amina, happy 60th birthday. Welcome to the 60th club. To be honest with you, I was shocked to hear that you were turning 60. You just do everything, accomplish everything, and uh, inspire everybody. Why I've loved working with you most of all is your true trademark, which is your boundless caring and your genuine concern for others. How determined you were then and have always been about putting the needs of people first. You are full of energy. You are full of sense of commitment for people who have been left behind. Your honesty, your courage, your kindness, your smartness, your toughness. You have turned your great personal accomplishment of being a mother of six and a grandmother to a role model to girls and boys around the world, and especially in Africa. I feel you are a commander in chief. I love that we've worked together for a very long time. From where you are sitting, you've done so much. Thank you for bringing African women leaders within the UN system together. I do hope that you have a great day and that you are as proud of yourself and the things that you are and have done as I am proud to know. Keep on being who you are, saying what you say and doing what you do because you are great. I wish you the best in this world, good health, and all the things that you're dreaming to see happen, to happen. I pray for you continued good health, and that Allah bless you with many more years. I really wish you a wonderful day today, wonderful celebration. Happy birthday, dearest Amina. Happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Joyeux anniversaire. Happy birthday, Amina. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, my sister. We know and expect much more to come. You're just getting started. When the story of our nation is told tomorrow, you will have a place of honor. I want to wish her the best success and that the next 60 years will be as successful 
as the past ones. All the best, Amir. It's so special to see that these birthday greetings cut across every single walk of life, every personality, the young, the mature, men, women, a hallmark of a life that is truly one of service and legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, as we round up today's event, it's my pleasure to welcome, to give the vote of thanks on behalf of the family, Amina's sister, of course, like I said, she will be speaking for her family because even though we have such a distinguished group, this is also the birthday celebration of somebody who is loved by her sisters, her children, her grandchildren, her relatives. It's my pleasure to welcome Yasmin Mohammed. Excellency President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Excellencies, the Governors, um, I will start with Governor of Gombe State, if that's okay, Governors, as I think that's where we should recognize we're from. So, um, Governor Inoue Yahaya and all the other Governors, I would love to mention all your names, but I think I need to keep this brief. Honorable Ministers, distinguished guests, friends and family, all protocols observed. It is my privilege and honor to offer thanks on behalf of my wonderful sister Amina and family, and of course the center she set up, CPRDS, which stands for Center for Policy, Research and Development Institutions. I had to say that for all of you. I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to Her Excellency the ex-president of um, Liberia, Ellison, um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, for her inspiring presentation and thoughts on how to move Africa forward. In particular, the points you made about being part of the change, that men needed to be, to be part of the change, stood out to me. And also that, you know, the older generation need to hand over to the younger generation. I think that is absolutely key to us moving forward in Africa. Excellency Governor Inouye thank you for gracing us with your presence and sharing your vision on this important ongoing conversation and recognizing the role that women had to play. I'd also actually like to thank you for my outfit because you donated this last time we went to Gombe. You gave me the material, so I'd like to thank you very much. And it was made in Bochi. Okay, I had to add that, if you don't mind. Um, I want to also thank Folly Bar and... Arit Okpa for hosting and coordinating the event. We deeply pre appreciate your presence here today. I'm sure, like me, the audience found the discussion with Amina inspiring and informative. We do have a collective responsibility to overcome the challenges. We do need to listen to the young, encourage them, and definitely a can-do attitude. And also, as Amina always tells us, leave no one behind. To all those of you who have joined us virtually and in the outer room, you have not been forgotten, and I'm sure Amina feels deeply humbled that you have made it possible to be part of her incredible 60-year journey thus far. I can also not forget to mention the organizers of the event and CPRDS, which we mentioned earlier, for their hard work in ensuring a smooth event. Special mention to Kole Shatima also. I'd also like to give a special thanks and much appreciation to Jackie Farris and the Yaradua Center for the use of their halls. We really, really deeply appreciate this. Also, all civil society um, members who are here too. Most importantly, I would like to thank the good Lord Almighty for answering, um, ensuring this event was able to take place despite this unprecedented um, last year of events of the pandemic. Let's all continue to remain encouraged and know this too shall pass. Finally, I would like to personally thank our mother and father, Margaret Wilson, 
and Dr. Inua Muhammad, how proud we are to have had them both as our parents, because the reality is, is that we would not be here today without them. And I would like to end on a quote, which I think most of you know, it's an African proverb. And I really do believe that this actually sums up Amina quite well. I hope you agree with me. If you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you so much for all coming here today. Thank you so much for your patience, for your kind attention, for your involvement in the conversations, for your interest, and of course, for your well wishes. Ms. Mohammed, I join everyone else who has wished you happy birthday to wish you blessings and to continue to thank you for the life that you live that's so, so full of service and give you my most sincere prayers for your, your years going forward. My name is Ari Topol, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a pleasure to be your moderator at this event, and I wish you all a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.